Hey, Luca, thanks a lot for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> right. Well, um, <clears throat> I mean, you and I have spoken a few times before, but uh, maybe we can take it from the top. What, Obviously, we and everybody listening to this podcast, we care de- deeply about uh, the climate emergency and, and we're interested in speaking to people who who are doing something about it. And you, in particular, are doing something about it. Um, sure. What are you up to? What are you up to nowadays? Sure. So I'm one of the co-founders of the company called Juicy Marbles. Uh, and what we're doing is we're tackling the imminent crisis of the security in food system uh, by developing viable alternatives for plant-based prime cuts from plants. Uh, specifically, the first product that we're tackling is a plant-based filet mignon with which we're hoping to challenge the perception of what quality meat really is. Awesome. Um, so this this name, Juicy Marbles, that's, that's kind of an unusual name. What, uh, what led you to, mm-hmm. to choose that name? So we had a bit of a brainstorming session on what we want our brand to be. And we decided that one of the things that's super important to us is humor. Uh, and Juicy Marbles can be a bit of a double entendre to some extent, obviously, if you want it to be. We, to some extent, want it to be. Um, and, you know, first of all, juicy a steak really should be juicy uh marbles that comes kind of from marbling which is a quality in a high quality meat cut uh but then also marbles has a second connotation and we like to feel that we are you know going let's say balls to the wall here and there uh so we are not shy of using that connotation as well Uh, i think i think in english anything can be a double entendre if you say it with the right kind of facial expression (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah for sure (laughs) I'd love to come back to your brand in a minute because you've got you've got quite an interesting mm-hmm. brand. But um, you, you said sure. quite a lot in your intro, which which is probably worth uh, unpacking. So, I mean, you, you spoke about what part of your mission being to to address the security of food systems. Um, mm-hmm. do, do you want to talk a little bit about like what what is the the issue with with food systems that you're trying to address? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, look, obviously every brand in this space talks about it, but environment is a huge challenge. Uh, all of the global politicians are now talking about it, uh, but we feel that talking is just not enough these days. And we want to be there to provide viable alternatives. Uh, but there is also another challenge that we believe is worth addressing, which is just a humanitarian challenge of seeing how many people there are in the world and how many people are being born. And there is no way to reliably secure nutritious food for all of them with the current technology. So we believe the development of new technologies on how we think about food, how we produce food that is not only sustainable, but highly nutritious is something worth bringing to market. Uh, And so when we are developing products, we are really trying to make sure that our products are nutritiously superior than their meat counterparts because this is something that's not talked about as much as the environmental aspect, but we believe is just as important. Yeah, yeah. So I, I suppose that there are two sides to this uh, food food system security bit. One is that um, soon there's going to be 10 billion people uh, in the world. And yeah. is, is there enough uh, food to, you know, to, to support all of them? Uh, and then climate change is itself starting to be seen as kind of like a, um, a, a national security um, concern mm-hmm. um, and and perhaps for, for one of these reasons as well as riding rising tides even in places where there is food security uh, it's it's going to be difficult to, to feed everybody but also food yeah. itself the act of, of producing food uh, particularly beef is is you know one of the big contributors isn't it so is, is that part yeah. of your goal to kind of displace um, things like beef yeah I mean especially high intensity beef farming because uh, my, my perception personally, this is not necessarily the position of everyone within the company, but I believe that meat is not something that we're going to uproot within the next five years. But I would very much love to see if people do eat meat, that they source it from you know their local small farmers just supporting local economy. Mm. But most of the time, try to find sustainable alternatives like what we are trying to offer and what other companies are trying to offer. So removing that part of meat agriculture out of the system, the intensive farming in, you know, huge facilities in horrible conditions should be the first challenge. And there should be a distinction between meat. Not all meat is created equally. Still, I think it's important to try and remove as much meat from the system as possible. Mm. But I think that this is going to be a long and laborious process and it's important on how we think about it. Yeah, yeah. I think one thing that uh, the, that blew my mind when I started researching the, the causes of climate change is just what a big contributor 
agriculture is. I mean, agriculture to, to the un, uninformed layman seems like the most natural thing in the world, doesn't it? But um, yeah. it's actually a, a huge contributor. So what, what is it about um, about meat farming in, in, in particular, or, or specifically the types of meat farming that you're, you're talking about that, that makes it such a large contributor to climate change? Yeah, I mean, for sure. If you're just looking at GHG emissions, most of it, or a lot of it, comes from agriculture. And the huge part, or the most, the biggest part, actually comes from beef production or, you know, uh, beef raising. Uh, they produce a lot of methane, which, you know, is a highly, highly uh, degrading gas, which is not ideal. But also, as you look at the other aspects of just how much land is being used to raise cattle in comparison to just, I mean, how much people, how much land is used for where people live. Uh, and then if you do a bit of napkin math, you can see that the amount of feed that goes towards that and then the amount of water, it just gets to a level where you've got to think to yourself, I mean, why are we using that much arable land where you could be producing crops that can that are just as nutritious, maybe not historically as consumed, but with the use of today's technology, we can make them as tasty as beef or better. Mm. And then it just starts to fall apart. Because I mean, look, if you have Highland cattle who's grazing about because you couldn't possibly grow soy there, I think that's different than using the best land you have available where you could be growing anything just like, you know, a permaculture of different plant species, but you're using it all just to raise this monoculture of beef. I, I think that causes a lot of degradation. Mm. So in, in the in the future, you see, like uh, in, in 2050, you, you still see that there will be a place for um, cattle and uh, and lamb and goat and, and that kind of and, and those kinds of kinds of meat. So you're not looking to displace that entirely. I mean, I don't necessarily think so, because if you look at certain parts of the world, you know, having animals like goats and sheep who can graze in rocky terrain where you couldn't produce any other food mm -hmm. is still better in terms of humanitarian issue. Obviously, we would love to be in a place where we have everything produced by plant-based uh, just to avoid all the unnecessary animal suffering as well, because this is a huge contribution to the cause as well. But still, I think that if you look at the humanitarian aspect, there's people who are hungry in the world. If the only solution for their hunger is that they raise their three, four goats, I'm all up for that because it still addresses their main concern on how to survive. Uh, but people in the developed world really should reconsider their nutrition choices because they have everything available. And by making that choices, they will also kind of promote this thinking, which will inevitably lead to the third world countries where it may not be possible to make that change now, but you know, maybe in 20 years, it could be a viable solution. Look, I don't know. It might be possible in two years, hopefully. Mm -hmm. I I'm just saying that there are levels to this, at least from my personal view. So I, I used to be a big meat eater. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, I've lifted a lot of weights in my time and, and people who lift weights like to eat a lot of chicken and, and you know, and beef. For, sure. I mean, beef is so delicious. <laughs> Uh, a lamb is so delicious. Goat is so delicious. Um, but I, I went, I went vegan um, about eighteen months ago, mm -hmm. and um, and part part of the the reason for for doing that, I mean, the, there are several reasons to to switch to a plant based diet. Uh, Planet is is a big one. Um, is is I saw the the Game Changers documentary. I don't know if you saw that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And and so you know, it's in that documentary that I saw. Well, first of all, it's it seems to be better for your you know if you want to be a high performance athlete, it seems to be a. a mm -hmm. Uh, reducing your intake of animal protein uh, will will help you to recover quickly from from exercise, and that's that's something mm -hmm. that I wanted to optimize for. But then they kind of made it made it look a lot easier because I was vegetarian way back in the day, and it was hard to be vegetarian mm -hmm. in the UK back in the day. Um, <laughs> but now, with, you know, it seems like this is a great time to be alive if you want to be a, a vegan. And and so I was delighted to see that companies like yours are producing uh, meats, which which are a really good substitute. Um, and I noticed from from your literature that that, that flavour and um, and mouthfeel and that kind of thing are, are, are quite important. You've got this yum profile, haven't you? That you that you talk about, <laughs> <laughs> or at least you did in the pack that I got. Uh, talk to us a bit about about that. Yeah, for sure. So look, when developing products, we didn't want to just match meat one for one. But we took a look at what we hate about meat because I mean, you can have a filet mignon that's great, but if you really think about it long enough, you're going to find flaws in it. 
And when you talk about the YUM profile, what that is, is if you consider, I mean, I assume that you still remember 18 months is not that long. So imagine chewing into a really succulent piece of steak, look the best one you've ever had. And the first bite that you take, you know, all of the juices come oozing out of that meat. But then as you keep chewing it in your mouth, you rupture all the cells and you get to a point where you have just a, a sawdusty consistency in your mouth. And you just want to swallow that down so that you can get to the next, you know, yummy piece. But with plant-based protein, you can kind of engineer the protein the way you want it to behave. And we are able to have better water absor absorption, which means that you don't ever get to a point where you have a really sawdusty consistency in your mouth. And so the juiciness retention and the uh, flavor release is prolonged in comparison. So yeah, this is what we call our extended yum profile. Because <laughs> uh, you have the beautiful experience of eating a steak throughout your eating experience. <laughs> mm, mm. So you, you guys very kindly sent me one of your one of your filet mignon steaks uh, a while back, mm -hmm. maybe yeah, six months ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, something like that. It was, I assume, one of the earlier prototypes. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm happy to say that we've improved upon it, but I'm curious to hear your feedback regardless. Yeah. So it was. Uh, I mean, this is this is not a plug for your, for your product, but I I very much enjoyed it. <laughs> I I thought it was. Um, I mean, I almost I almost felt not qualified to cook it <laughs> because I I could see that it's it, it's kind of it's. I mean, you you pitched it to be a very premium product. Uh, haven't you? And that, and you shipped it in this very mm. nice box with with all of these instructions on, uh, like a you know. I, I, we'll talk about your brand in a minute, but in there there were some instructions on this is how to get the best out of it. And I you know I devote a lot of thinking time to to cooking, and I've you know I, I cook several times a day, but I still felt like ah I'd I'd, I'd love to, to to experience this in the hands of of a great chef. So I just wanted to say that it's super interesting that you felt to some extent intimidated by the product because that's one of the main things we are trying to address because. Mm. When people go out and buy a filet mignon to cook at home or a ribeye or whatever steak, it's usually expensive. And then if you're really not savvy on how to prepare it, you might have a lot of, you know, appliances like your fancy meat thermometer that is connected to your smartphone and whatever. But the issue is that meat is so unforgiving. Mm. And if you go that few degrees above its perfect medium rare temperature, you will get to a point where it's not perfect anymore. And it's not even close to perfect. It's far from perfect because it gets dry super quickly. Mm -hmm. And when I was talking before on how we are trying to engineer a better product when making it with plant protein, this is one of the things that was super important to us. Make a product that's not intimidating, that, you know, if you come home after work a bit tired, you chuck it in a pan, you forget about it for a few minutes, it goes above what would be considered a perfect internal temperature for beef. It's not ruined, it's still good. Obviously, you know, anyone can burn or, you know, dry it out a bit, but not to an extent as you would with beef. And hopefully this will make it more user friendly so that you can think about, I want to have something nice, but I don't want to worry about it too much. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. So, it, I mean, when, when we think about meat alternatives or alt food in, in general, we, mm -hmm. it's, it's tempting to think that it's, it's really just a one dimension and, and mm -hmm. the the thing that you're trying to replace is somewhere on on that on that axis, and then the thing that you're making to replace it is somewhere else. And that one axis is mm -hmm. flavor. Does it taste? Does it, but actually, what what you're what you're bringing out is that there are multiple dimensions. So, you know, how how forgiving is it to cook? That's that's one mm -hmm. dimension. Um, how how healthy it is, which again is multiple dimensions. How much saturated fat yep. is in it? How much cholesterol? Yada yada. Um, what it looks like uh, in the plate. That that you know how 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 fibrous it is. Um, how, how many of these things are you are you considering as you're as you're trying to optimize your product? So obviously you can't tackle everything, but we try to listen to what we think consumers want to try to talk to as much of them as possible. Uh, but the main thing for us is obviously try to create the best possible flavor so that people are satisfied trying it out. Make sure that it's more user friendly and that it improves on some drawbacks of meat, such as I mentioned previously. And the health aspect is also important to us. So this is something that we are tackling bit by bit, but we really made a conscious decision on not using saturated fats such as coconut oil or palm oil. Uh, in our products, we are now using sunflower oil because it has such a low level of saturated fats. And we feel that it's important that if we are bringing something new to the market, that we are conscious of that as well. Obviously, 
you know, there's still some sodium in it. There's still some other things, but making these small and very rational choices on what we want to strive for is important. Also in the context of, as I was saying before, this humanitarian approach, because if we are making new food per, for the new generation of people, why not improve it so that they have a better life eating it as well? Yeah. Okay. So let, let, let's talk about that because you, you've, you've started it at like a very, or, you know, I don't know what your plan is for the future, but you, you're, you're producing quite a premium product, aren't you? And when we talk about food security, that's, that's a problem that's going to hit kind of the developing world mm -hmm. before it hits the developed world. Um, sure. Tell me about that. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I have, our hy hypothesis is that going to market with a new technology that allows us to make whole cuts, the best way to do it is to make a fancy product, uh, if for nothing else, because it grabs the attention of people. Uh, but still, even when we are trying to do that, our really big goal is that we not only match the meat prices, but that we outcompete them. So mm -hmm. we are now projecting that even at launch, we'll be able to compete with meat prices and beat them out within the next two to three years. And in that way, we want to kind of democratize the access of these traditionally fancy or premium meat cuts towards a wider audience. Um, obviously that's not gonna solve the food security challenge in itself. So when we are thinking about developing new products, uh, we are thinking about exploring or expanding our product portfolio outside of just this premium level. Uh, but doing that is something that I think would require us to reconsider our branding approach as well, because Juicy Marbles, the way it is currently set up is a premium brand, even though we'll try to create lower prices for our products so that we can outcompete meat. Uh, but I would very much love to see our company developing into a consortium of different brands that address different uh, market niches and provide products for just about anyone in the market. But mm -hmm. that is a kind of long standing goal. We still gotta, you know, take these small steps first. Yeah. I, I mean, that's how Tesla went about it, isn't it? They start off with just super yeah. premium, but it was always their goal to have this, mm. this super, you know, a, a much more affordable vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a smart way of yeah, going about sure. it because I mean, food is alt, alt meat, veganism in general, uh, plant based diets suffer from a similar malaise to electric vehicles back in the day when electric vehicles looked shit they looked they they, they, were, they were for cranked <laughs> crank people weren't they 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 were they were shaped like a shoe they didn't have any range they didn't go fast and um and so they weren't sexy so they, they there's no way that it was aspirational and uh, so to, mm -hmm. to to shift the opinions of millions of people over to actually i really want an electric vehicles that they're, they're now the most desirable thing um mm -hmm. i think you know that was a smart move to to enter with a, a premium product yeah, sure. I mean, they went out with the Roadster. It was expensive as all hell. Uh, but doing that, they were able to capture market attention. Doing that, they were able to, yeah, as you said, make it sexy. Uh, you know, nobody's gonna flip their minds over tofu, I don't think. Mm. Uh, but doing things that might be considered sexy will eventually lead people to eating more tofu as well. At least I certainly hope so. Tofu can be delicious as fuck if you make it well. Yeah. Um, so... I think it's a similar approach yeah. and, you know, this comparison to Tesla does pop up when we're talking about this go to market strategy. Obviously they're in a whole different market comparison to Tesla's is are now becoming a bit redundant, I think everywhere. Uh, but the way they went about it, I think is super sensible. Mm. There's, there's something, um, I mean, it's worth sticking on this point for, for a bit longer that there's something about mm -hmm. veganism, which is polarizing. Um, I, I found, I mean, I, I don't, I don't say that I'm vegan often now. I, I say I have a plant-based diet or I don't eat that much meat mm -hmm. because I've noticed, I don't know why this is, but I've noticed if, if I say to people I'm vegan, then immediately they see that as like, I'm, I'm challenging them directly. Uh, you know, I've, um, and they feel like they have to explain why they're not vegan. Uh, maybe talking about why they love meat, you know, how they love meat so much or that they don't believe there's enough nutrition in a plant-based diet. But I'm simply saying, listen, man, I'm vegan. I'm not talking about you, but. It, mm -hmm. it seems to be something very much tied up in your identity, whether you're like a meat eater yeah. or a vegan. Um, I wonder how it's possible to, to bring both of those camps together. I think that the word veganism have is a carry heavy burden because historically when someone was vegan, most often they're not, they had this whole package around them of vegan is this and that. 
And when you're a vegan, you're also on a mission to make other people vegan. Mm, mm. I think that when you're plant-based, you don't care as much. Obviously you still do, but not to an extent where you want to fight someone or argue with them. And I think it's about communications approach. Because when you're talking about plant-based, you are offering an alternative, which I think more and more people are open to and actively looking for. And when you say vegan, just because of the connotation of the world, people will have a defense mechanism of, oh, you want to attack my personal beliefs with the fact that I'm not vegan and you are, and you feel superior. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not vegan. I, I still eat meat actually, uh, less and less so, uh, doing this, but you know, I feel that the product we're making is not vegan. It is plant-based. And it's important to communicate it that way because in that sense, it's kind of reaching across the aisle towards meat eaters and saying, look, I don't want to take anything away from you. Try it out. I hope you like it. And if you do, why not consider giving it a shot? Uh, and that's why we're very conscious about how we try and communicate. And that goes back to the brand. But we want to use humor and trying to be approachable. And I think it helps that myself and another co-founder are meat eaters that or that we, you know, dabble in meat because it just adds a different perception to it i think mm -hmm. i hope mm -hmm. i don't know uh but definitely yeah veganism carries such a heavy burden of <laughs> what vegan is considered to be or who vegan is considered to be do you, do you think it's possible so so the guys the guys at huel and um what's the what's the american version um of huel um, oh the so soylent soylent they they're looking. They're kind of making astronaut food, aren't they? Where it's mm -hmm. it should it should be possible. I don't know whether it's possible to pull this off to make a product that you can exist solely on that. So you could you could have mm -hmm. Soylent or Huel kind of three three meals a day uh, forever. I you know, I know guys who've tried mm -hmm. that, and there's just so much fiber in it that it becomes difficult to to maintain your status quo. Let's say after after a while. Sure. Um, but is is it possible to create an environment where alt meat is kind of the only meat that do we eat? Is is it kind of you know, healthy is is not a very useful word, but is it kind of healthy enough to sure. subsist only on, exist only on that? I would say yes, if you're talking about meat, because if you're talking about the amino acids that, you know, human body needs, you can definitely replicate this with just the use of plant protein. You definitely do not need to have meat in any fashion. Mm -hmm. um, but then if you think of the whole macros and micros, um, as soon as you get down to a level where you want to add some carbohydrates or starches or, you know, whatever carbohydrate form you want to have, uh, you can add it to the product, but it's going to change the product to an extent where it might be a different product than a steak. It might behave differently. I still think that this is a good mental exercise and something that given the opportunity, I would love to try and examine more in depth in an R and D lab because mm. I mean, Huel or Jimmy Joy or Soylent or whatever, they have their drawbacks, I feel like. Still, I have a bag of them available on hand at any time because my nutritional habits are not at a standard where I would want them to be. Uh, mostly because I find it hard to take the time to prepare a super nutritious meal here and there. And that, even though it feels a bit like cheating, still kind of takes my mind off of it and allows me to have something that I at least nutritionally know is good for me, even though mm. it's not the best meal in the world. It's, it's, it's better than junk food. Further, it's, it's, it's got kind it's of... It's better than junk food, exactly. Yeah, I would much rather have a shake that I know has been engineered to where it should nutritionally satisfy my requirements than go to McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would very much for love me... for McDonald's to have a patty that does that. <laughs> Mm, yeah yeah have you, have you tried have you tried Huel's kind of they've got a hot range where it's yeah I tried so I, I mean one of their Mexican ones is quite good I mean it's not again it's not a Mexican meal that you would get in a great <laughs> Mexican restaurant but it's sufficient for my requirements when yeah. I feel package well it's I mean so it's like a pot noodle isn't it you just pour water yeah. over it like like yeah. cheap one you know where you get noodles like it's one dollar for five packets or something it's like that kind of noodle <laughs> but it's really good for you yeah. so yeah that I think it it occupies a very useful space. Can we can we talk mm -hmm. about like your your company then? So you know you you started sure. a company to do this thing. So you created this amazing product. How did how did it come mm -hmm. about that that you decided to start a company and go on this whole journey? Oh, it was very organic. So 
one of my co-founders and I met at university and just wanted to do stuff without that, you know, we were bored at the time mm -hmm. and wanted to, you know, fuck around. Uh, and what we also wanted to do is try to earn some money doing that things. And so hackathons became kind of our thing. You know, we looked around and we saw, oh, a monetary prize for, you know, a weekend where you can just develop some random thoughts. And we were like, that seems just about right. Mm -hmm. Um, and we started doing that just for the fun of it really. Uh, but eventually at one of those events, we met Tilan, who is now a third co-founder and the CEO and his background is in food science, which was super great for us because mm -hmm. we were always dabbling in this space. But talking to him, we were able, able to get someone with business experience who was able to take us under his wing and mentor us, which, you know, not a lot of people were prepared to do. And then from there, it just kind of grew organically to a point where we were always presented with different opportunities and were, I think, super lucky enough to, to have chosen the right ones to pursue. Even though some of them failed miserably or turned out to be mistakes, they still allowed us to have this progression of what we thought we want to be doing. And for example, we were able to launch a plant-based burger in Slovenia's largest retailer, which was just before, you know, all of the global competition came to this part mm. of Europe. Mm. And we were the first one out there, but we were making a burger <laughs> and that just, you know, went down the drain quite quickly as soon as Beyond came and all of the other retailers with their private labels. But, you know, that thought is an important lesson on plant-based market is exploding and that burgers are now becoming not obsolete, but they're becoming ubiquitous to a point where trying to do something in that space might be very hard to do. Mm. And then looking at the knowledge we had, we tried thinking about what we want to do. And we were able to develop this technology for texturizing protein. And then it was a really difficult decision on, do we really want to pursue this full time? Seeing how both of us were working on our, you know, graduate schools at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but oh, then wow. we got okay. the opportunity. So this, this whole story so far is while you were still at grad school. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Okay. I, can, can I, can I just, yeah. so let's come back to that in a sec. Can I just jump, jump back a little sure, bit? Sure. So it, it seems like, um, these, these hackathons were kind of quite, quite formative. So you, you were placed in this environment yeah. where competitively you were having to come up with, with brand new stuff in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it sounds like that was a very useful kind of primer for, for doing your own company. Was it? Oh, for sure. Look, so I always thought that I would want to do something for myself in terms of a company someday. I just never thought I would have the opportunity to do it this early in my career. Mm. Cause it always seemed like, oh, she's starting a company. You need this and that, and it's a whole process and thing, but going through these hackathons, you are, yeah, kind of exposed to other people who've done it and you see that it is possible and it's just about developing your thinking and what you want to work on. And I think that that was super helpful because it allowed us to see that you know, there are options on how we want to do that. And you don't necessarily have to sacrifice everything you're doing to try out something new. Mm. You can, if you want to start a business, you can do it on two hours a week to begin with, um, and then explore that expand it. And yeah, so I mean, coming back to, to the story I was telling it's the main thing where it kind of became a thing of shit, do we want to do that was when we applied for Y Combinator and we got an invitation to, to come there. And at that point, I mean, obviously the default answer is, yeah, I'm dropping everything and I'm doing it because it's Y Combinator. Yeah. But still, you know, <laughs> it did require some other sacrifices that I always thought that I'm, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to have a PhD and then I'm going to work in a lab and then later on, hopefully do something for myself. Given the opportunity now, I just thought to myself, you know, I can always go back to school. <laughs> Uh, this is not something that I might get a chance to try out again, at least not in that form. Mm. So yeah, we jumped in it and super glad that we did. We are now a team of 15, 16. Uh, we are finishing up our pilot facility that should go live by the end of the year. Products would be available then in early 2020. So Q1 is our go-to-market kind of goal. So knock on the wood. Um, and uh, yeah, it is just super exciting. I'm so glad that this turned out the way that or that it is so far. So, so doing doing something like Y Combinator that 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 had kind of an accelerating effect. It had yeah. the desired effect of taking you from being a few guys in a bedroom to being now you're a proper company with facilities and 16 staff and and so on. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> 
Calling it a proper company still has a weird ring to it for me. <laughs> I, I don't ever want to be a proper company. I would very much love to be where we are right now, even if we're a company someday of hundreds. I, I just think that I don't want to be too corporate-y. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. I, I still would love to have fun doing everything we're doing. Uh, but, but yeah, to, to go to what you were saying, obviously going through Y Combinator is like a bit of a, it gives you that badge of, you know, we went through Y Combinator, so someone else thinks that we are worth looking into, yeah. which is helpful when you're trying to raise funds, for example, or when you're trying to talk to buyers or consumers, because they do not look at you as before when you were just someone doing something, but you're, you're kind of pre-vetted, if that makes sense. Why did you apply to YC in the first place? Um, we were at a point where our company was almost dying, but we felt that we have a technology that can bring about some change sometimes, hopefully. Um, and we did not only apply for Y Combinator, we applied for many other accelerators where we feel, felt that we could gain value. Uh, but it was actually one of our advisors, Ron Shigeta, who strongly suggested that we also apply for YC. Because we kind of felt like we applied once before, we didn't even get, you know, an invitation to an interview, which is quite common, especially the first time around. Mm -hmm. And we felt that, well, what we're doing is cool, but they're not going to be interested in us. And he really strongly suggested that, look, don't think about it that way. Try it out. Talk to some of the alums who went through it. Try and get maybe a recommendation if they like what you're doing. Uh, and, you know, because of his vote of confidence in us, I think that we were able to kind of re-examine what we were working on and say to ourselves, I mean, that's quite cool. They might be interested and just went for it. And, you know, super fortunate that we did that. Otherwise, we might be in a different situation today than we were. We might have been better off. Who knows? But I I'm super happy with the decision that we made. And yeah. I thought I think that it brought us further along than we might even think about. So you um, you spoke about you don't you don't ever want to feel like you're a proper company. Uh, actually, there's, there's a lot about mm -hmm. your brand that makes you feel like an improper company. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's quite yeah. profane, isn't it? You've you've got uh, I I love it by the way. I mean, I'd I'd probably wear a Juicy Marvels T-shirt <laughs> if, if you produce it. You've got these these cat characters that are all being really rude to each other. They're swearing a lot. It's um mm -hmm. it's really quite rude and, and and in your face. I love it. Yeah. Who who did that for you? Did you guys? <laughs> and why did no, you yeah, why terrible. did you choose to be so um you know why did you go down that route? Uh, so yeah, we've done this internally. We have Vladimir, another co-founder. He's Look, he's amazing. I'm so glad that we have him because brand, I think, is a huge part of what we're trying to do. Uh, not, not just for us. I think that having a strong brand is important in this space so that you can try and stand out a little bit. Um, and yeah, as I talked about before, I think that, you know, yeah, it may be a bit obscene or a bit rude or a bit in your face. But I, my, my personal belief is that, you know, words that are seen as obscene don't necessarily carry any meaning in themselves intrinsically, and it's about connotation. Um, and you are, if you're able to use that in a laid back sense, I think you become more approachable. And this is certainly the tone that we are trying to strike of, look, we are not a corporation. We are not here to try and be too PC. Uh, we want, we're doing this because it's fun. We're having fun doing that. We want you to have fun with our products. Mm -hmm. And it's again about reaching across the aisle because you, I think really gotta be careful that as a brand, you're not preachy and judgmental of people who may not, uh, be in a place where they respect your choices of, you know, being plant-based or why you were trying to promote that, but instead you should try and understand them and offer them the opportunity to laugh at us, at themselves, mm. and come to an understanding of, look, we're not trying to take away your meat. We're not trying to do anything. We're just here fucking around and having fun. If you want to consider giving us a shot, that's fine. If not, that's fine as well. Hope you had a chuckle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know, that's, that's it really, I think. It, there's something that feels quite caliber about um, a company that's able to, to laugh at itself and to really kind of publicly stand for something quite quite strongly. Um, you know, mm -hmm. if, if you're if you're very opinionated as a company and you, you've got kind of quite an edgy brand, you're going to put a bunch of people off. 
Um, but then oh, the people yeah, who sure like you that. are really going to like you a lot. You know, you know, and yeah, that's another thing. Yeah. Yeah, if, th that's definitely a thing. Because we, we had a few people reach out and say, oh, your brand is very profane or I really hate the name. Or, but these were so few and far between. And then on the other side, we had so many people say, oh, I love it. That's a great approach. Don't change it. And that's, so at first I hated the brand Juicy Marbles because of the, you know, double entendre connotations. <laughs> I was really against it because I thought, oh, what will people think? What changed it for me is I was talking to an investor and I asked them for their feedback on the brand. And they said that they thought it was, they had a visceral reaction to it. And just the fact that they said visceral to me was what changed me, changed my outlook on it. Because even if it was visceral in the sense of they hated it, they at least had emotions about it and they were not just ambivalent towards, oh, I don't really care. Mm -hmm. And then seeing this through people either on Instagram or other investors or people I talked to who said, oh yeah, it's great. I read through your website. It's fun. I, I would much rather have it that some people are offended by us because we are not specifically offending anyone, but you know, some people will get offended by the word, by the word fuck itself. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, you'll have people who can appreciate that. And I would much rather talk and cater to those people and make sure that the following we have is one where, you know, people are feel strongly about the brand. Let's put it that way. What, what's next for you guys? What, what are the next big things that you're, you're looking forward to in the juicy models journey? Yeah, for sure. So the first thing is finish up the pilot facility. It is getting to a point where it's super exciting. Um, and it should go live by the end of the year. What, so what, what, what's that like? Could you tell us? So the pilot facility, what, what is that? And, and what, does it, what does it look like? This for us is the first facility that will allow us to produce at commercial scale. Basically meaning we will be in a position where we can not only have small samples, but we can start selling to retailers and have the product be available to general public. Um, it's the first step towards being able to cater to a really wide audience. Still, it's a pilot facility. It's not like we're going to change the world with it, mm. but we'll be in a position where we can at least start having the product available. Um, and we are hoping to scale quite rapidly uh, with you know initial output being much greater than where we are today mm. and then scaling this further within the next few months. Be before before you built the pilot facility, where were you making, where where were you making your your meat? We were make, we had a lab, we had a different facility, but it was okay. small to a point where we couldn't, uh, you know, reliably produce at scale. And now we are, you know, in, in a different space. And is is that is that is that tough? I mean, is 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 there a learning curve there going from having a small lab? You know, maybe at one point you were in your oh, yeah. kitchens, then you went to a lab and now, now you're in a pilot facility. Is, is, is there much of a yeah, learning curve? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there is definitely challenges in scaling things up because, you know, if nothing else, when you are in a lab or in your own kitchen, you don't have to think about, oh shit, I'm going to need to have an electrician come and draw huge power lines to power these huge ass machines. Mm -hmm. And, oh, where is all the water going to go? We need to figure out a system for that. And it also got to follow all of this regulation. And it, we also got to make sure that there's logistic ways, you know, predicted so that we don't have any confusion even on the floor. Uh, but it, it's such fun doing it because, uh, you know, what you're doing it for and with every small improvement that you make, you know, just having this one new outlet so that you can plug in a new machine, it feels like a really, a small victory, but a victory nonetheless. <laughs> and, you know, when you're able to get to a point where we are now, when you're starting to see it come together, it's not done yet. There's still things that need to be done, but you start to see a picture of where it's going. Uh, I don't know, I'm just super optimistic about it. And again, very blessed that we're in a position we are in. I'd imagine that a lot of people who would like one day to start their own company and they've got this thing that they're very good. Maybe they're very good at tech. Maybe they're very good at um, recipes or, or whatever it is that they're, they're good at. They want to start a company. Mm -hmm. they, they think about, they look at companies at scale and they look at building mm -hmm. things like a pilot facility where you've got, you've got to solve this electrical problem. How do you get all of this electricity in, into the building? That, and they think, I wouldn't even know where to start. I wouldn't even know where to start with any of that. And so therefore I'm not going to go down this journey. <laughs> yeah. Look, thankfully one of our co-founders just recently, uh, built a house. So he has a lot of contacts with electricians and shit. Uh, right. <laughs> no, 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 but you know, I'm kidding. Uh, 
it is just about reaching out to people and trying to be very proactive and cognizant of the fact that you don't understand stuff, but there are people who do mm -hmm. and you got to find them. And, you know, you are able to find them. That's not a problem anywhere in the world. Um, it's just about, you know, you know what you want, you know what you're doing it for. And then it's just about finding people who can help you along with the journey. Mm. So getting this new plant finished, that's, um, that's the next, that's the next big milestone. Once you've got that done, then what, what does that, you know, what does that unlock for you? Well, that unlocks the ability of us for us to talk to retailers and say, look, we have pallets of, upon pallets of product. We are ready to put them on a truck or on a ship or on a plane or whatever works for them. And you can have them on store shelves literally the day after you got them. Mm. And so this is something that we are now starting. We're engaging with a few retailers that we think would be a good partner for us to launch with. And we, we are quite confident of the Q1 2022 launch date. Cool. Well, listen, all the best with it. I'm very excited. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Cheers. And thanks a lot for coming on the show. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great chatting with you. Hopefully we'll get a chance to do it again quite soon. Yeah, cool. Yeah.